yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm Berg Engnott from CQT in Singapore. And uh, thank you for inviting me to present at this conference. So I, I will talk about a, a little problem that we have been working on for a while. And now I think we have a very good solution. So this is about solving time dependent Schrodinger equation uh, with high accuracy. And there are other applications to it also, but I will only talk about this now. So um, <clears throat> just to get started, <clears throat> If we have a Schrodinger <coughs> equation to solve for uh, a wave function, then one way of doing this is just using the unitary evolution operator that advances you uh, by time t from the initial state to the final state. And, uh, and that's, of course, this exponential structure. And, uh, and in the exponent, you have the Hamilton operator. And I will just, for the purpose of this talk, just simplify to a single particle moving in 3D, which has a kinetic energy and a potential energy. So it's a kinetic energy that depends on the momentum, a potential energy that depends on the position. And of course, these two pieces of the Hamilton operator do not commute. And since they do not commute, we cannot factorize the unitary evolution operator. So <clears throat> of course we can factorize it, but we introduce a mistake. Now, why do you want to factorize? Because if something only depends on R or only on P, well, if you have position wave functions, then this is the R dependent factor is just a phase factor. And if you have momentum wave functions, then the kinetic energy turns into a phase factor. So by switching from position wave functions to momentum wave functions with uh, some fast Fourier transform algorithm, uh, you can incorporate these operators by just multiplying the, <clears throat> the wave functions with position or momentum dependent phase factors. But you have to go back and forth between momentum and position uh, representation, representation all the time. Now, this particular factorization isn't very good because you have an error of order t squared. So this is not something uh, you should be doing. However, already in the 1700s, <laughs> Newton in his Principia <laughs> pointed out that there is something that <laughs> is now called the leapfrog approximation. I, I don't know whether he used that terminology or not, where <laughs> you still factorize in terms that are only kinetic energy, only potential energy, but in a more symmetric fashion where you have half of the potential energy to <laughs> factor first and the full kinetic energy, then half of the potential energy factor. And this, so this is the leapfrog uh, two approximation to the unitary evolution operator. That has the property that if you change the sign of t, you always get the edge on, you get the inverse. Um, statement about approximations of this kind, which are called Suzuki Trotter type approximations. If reversing the sign of t gives you the edge joint, then the error is always proportional to an odd power of t. So here <coughs> we have an approximation which is very similar to what you saw on the previous slide, huh? except that we have broken up the potential energy term into two pieces and that rem removes the second uh, order error. And now we have an or error that goes like t cubed. So this <coughs> is then an example of what is called a second order Suzuki Trotter approximation. Now we use this in a particular way, namely by breaking up the duration t for the full evolution into small steps, say n small steps, each of length tau. So tau is t divided by n. And then we apply the leapfrog, uh, the leapfrog approximation to each tau interval. So the, the u of t becomes the u of tau to the power n. And then th this is approximation by using the leapfrog approximation for each short time interval tau. Now for each of them, we have a, an error, which is tau cubed. There is n such terms. So roughly we get an error that's like n t cubed. And so for the whole time interval, uh, <clears throat> this scales like one over n squared. So you could think if you make n big enough, this will be very good. And uh, well, for some applications it is, but for many practical approx approximations, this is simply not good enough. Now, um, how can we do better? Well. If you look at the standard literature on this, in particular, this article by Hatano and Suzuki uh, of 2005, I will give references later. They have a fourth order Suzuki-Trotter approximation, which has 11 factors. 
so so that means that you have to do a lot of this switching back and forth between position and momentum description okay uh, so while, while that is still acceptable in some sense uh, what is really not so good about this factorization is that some of the time steps are negative so let me just go back so this is half a, a time step a full time step half a time step now in this 11 factor uh, fourth order approximation, some of the time steps go back in time. And, and, uh, and there are some, some uh, applications that simply cannot to tolerate uh, uh, time steps that, that have the wrong sign. So, so it means that these uh, negative time steps, they are not just troublesome, but they just render the approximation useless for, co for some applications. Now, there is an alternative to this fourth order Suzuki Trotter approximation with the 11 factors, namely a fourth order approximation with only five factors and all positive time steps. <clears throat> so there's a little bit of history for this particular approximation. There's a paper by Chin in, in uh, 97, a, a paper by Omelian, Merklord and Fo Folk in uh, 2002, and then our own work from 2018. There are different ways of arriving at the same answer. So here you see Potential energy, one sixth of potential energy, two thirds of potential energy, one sixth of potential energy, <coughs> kinetic energy, half of the kinetic energy, half of the kinetic energy term, and uh, an extra term that goes not with the potential energy, but with the square of the force that derives from the potential energy. And while this has a factor T, this has a factor T cubed. So, so however, this, this approximation as a whole is sort of a fourth order version of the leapfrog. So the error is in T to the five. And this fourth order leapfrog approximation actually works wonderfully. We have benchmarked this against other approximations quite extensively. And the details you can find in this paper by Hue and, uh, uh, and others in 2020. And I just quote from the paper that the fourth order leapfrog outperforms all the other approximations in both accuracy and computation time. So it's, it's uh, uh, cheap, relatively cheap in computation time, and it's also highly accurate. <clears throat> so uh, let's, let's apply this to some, to some problem. Now, um, the problem I'm choosing is actually the stern galach interferometer. So let me, let me re, uh, recall a little bit of the history of that particular problem. <clears throat> so um, there's, always, there's always a debate about measurements in quantum mechanics and so forth, right? And if you look at David Bohm's book, actually a really nice uh, textbook on quantum mechanics, the first book I believe from which you could actually teach the, the topic to students, written in 1951, they are born, uh, kind of asked the question whether the splitting of the beam that occurs in the stern galach experiment can be undone, okay? And then uh, uh, Wigner, uh, some years later, in a paper in the American Journal of Physics, asks essentially the same question, and they both say that, yes, the entanglement established by a stern galach magnet, so that's what is happening here, right? Uh, that that can be undone, completely reversed, with a full recovery of the initial spin state of, say, the silver atoms entering the uh, stern galach apparatus, the experiment done uh, 100 years ago, actually, in 1922. Uh, <clears throat> now, of course, uh, with Bohm and uh, Wigner uh, making statements, then others are happy to parrot their wisdom. And, and, uh, and so that's the state of affairs uh, uh, if you look at some part of the literatures. So the answer is, well, you, you have your stern galach apparatus. You just add three copies of the same thing, okay, with reverse magnetic fields for two stretches and that's the same direction of the magnetic field in the last thing. And ready is your stern galach interferometer, okay? The beam gets split. <coughs> So at this point, you have transferred momentum and the, the, the beams uh, uh, fly apart, the partial beams fly apart. Then, then this magnet undoes the momentum transfer. So now the, the beams are moving parallel, but you still have a separation in space. And then you just do the same thing again, uh, but now just, just transferring momentum uh, first such that it gets the beams closer. And then you undo the momentum transfer so that you have no net momentum transfer in the end and no net displacement. And, and uh, yeah, if everything just is, is done right, then 
uh, the original spin state that you had for the atom entering the apparatus uh, is recovered as you come out. Now, Bohm and Wigner, of course, knew that this is not going to be easy. Bohm speaks that you need a fantastic precision to do that. And Wigner uh, points out that the experiment would be difficult to perform. Um, but of course, implicitly, both of them say, just keep trying and you'll succeed. But really? Seriously? Okay. Let's take a look. Okay. Let's take a look at an oversimplified one-dimensional model with a time-dependent force. So I'm translating the motion of the atom along the y-axis through the magnet just into a time dependence, okay, and ignore all the uh, details of the y-motion and certainly ignore the details of the x-motion and only look at, at the motion in the transverse z-direction. <laughs> and so the force is now a function of time um, uh, multiplied by the z component of the Pauli spin uh, uh, vector operator. And so that gives you a, a, a spin dependent force. And so let's say we have this f of t such time, it has the value f zero for the two central magnets from one quarter to three quarters of the time, the force is reversed. And then for the last uh, magnet, you have the same force again uh, in the positive direction. And if you just work this out and it separates the beam in momentum after the first uh, quarter of the apparatus, by one half F zero T. So of course this for splitting the beam, this has to be large compared with the momentum spread that you begin with. And halfway through the apparatus, the separation in Z is uh, uh, one eight F zero T squared divided by M. The one eighth is not important, but this uh, force and time dependence is important. And that has to be large compared with the initial spread in, in, in Z uh, because you want to split the beams. You want to be able to put your finger between the two beams, okay? And, and uh, also, uh, you are not getting any displacement or momentum transfer at the exit at, at time t when everything is over, the, the total separation is zero and the total momentum transfer is zero. So that's uh, just some modeling, this ideal uh, uh, Stern-Gerlach interferometer with a little bit of simplification because we do everything in 1D and, and uh, rather than talking about magnetic fields, we just talk about time dependent force. Now, but let's take this seriously for a moment and ask ourselves, well, with which precision would your friend, the experimenter, have to <clears throat> make three copies of the initial apparatus? Well, so let's just say, what are the tolerance for imperfections? If we have imper imperfections in realizing this ideal f of t, then we will have errors. The, the final uh, split in, in Z will not be zero, but it will be hopefully small compared by the coherence length, which is uh, Planck's constant divided by the spread in momentum. This is spread in momentum that we have here. And, and the, the, the leftover momentum transfer between the two beams, yeah, that has to be small compared with uh, the coherence length in momentum space, which is h bar divided by the spread in in z, <clears throat> and so uh, so I put in a, a factor here to make sure that this has to be small, say something of the order of a tenth. Okay, but well, not requiring ridiculous precision, just something like a factor of ten. Now, if you put this together, then the product has to be less than epsilon squared h bar squared, and the product of delta z and delta p. And this is where Heisenberg steps in and he tells you that this product is at least half an h bar, <clears throat> which means that um, this, this whole product is, is mu much, much smaller than h bar. This epsilon is already a factor of 100. And then if you are unlucky that delta c delta p is also not so small, and then, then it gets even smaller. But let's, let's just say that this, that this we, are, we are capable in making something like a minimum uncertainty state for, for the Z motion. Good luck with that in a real experiment, but let's just assume. And then, then uh, this product has to be much less than H bar, say a hundredth of H bar. <laughs> but if you translate this in, into uh, instructions for your colleague who does the experiment, you have to tell him that he has to control his macroscopic schon gallach interferometer with sub-microscopic precision. Okay, not something which is of the order of H bar, something which is much, much less than H bar. Okay, now, so this is, this is an old story uh, uh, far back in the last millennium. <clears throat> and now let's see, uh, 
Uh, yes, I mean, what we conclude uh, here is that it, it, we do indeed need fantastic precision and the experiment would be difficult to perform. <clears throat> but this is just a simplified one-dimensional model. We, we are not actually modeling the Stern-Gerlach apparatus. Now let's, let's do that, okay? <clears throat> and let's use uh, a realistic magnetic field uh, that's uh, not in conflict with Maxwell's equations and, and have the full three-dimensional dynamics. And now, wh why, is that, why is that not so easy? Because uh, you want to have a, a magnetic field that, say, has a Z component and a gradient in Z. <laughs> but you cannot have that all by itself. You also will need an X component with a gradient in X or a Y component with a gradient in Y or both. And then where the where the uh, um, magnets meet, let me go back okay, here. So between here and here, you reverse the, the magnetic field in the Z direction. So the Z component of your magnetic field uh, has also a Y dependence and that requires a Y component of the magnetic field with a Z dependence. So clearly you have all three components of, of uh, the magnetic field. And any approximation that says, well, you know, there's a dominant component, it's, it, I'm only paying attention to the Z component of the magnetic field. Well, that's, that's an approximation that may or may not be justified. Okay, so we are using um, a realistic magnetic field that's not in conflict with Maxwell's equations. We uh, take the full three-dimensional dynamics, so the atom is not just moving in the Z direction, but it also moves in the X and the Y direction if a force is acting on it. And then, uh, and then we're using this fourth order leapfrog that I described earlier, um, because it offers us the accuracy that we need to study this John Gala interferometer. So without that, we, we, we would not be able to do it. And what I want to point out is that the model is ideal. We are not even considering the imperfections that I talked, talked about on the previous slide. So we are, with that, that would come on top on what I tell you now, okay? So when you're done with all this calculation, you'll find that these results do not support Bohm's and Wigner's optimism. So let me show you here. This, this on the, on the uh, horizontal axis, we have the, the splitting of the beam in the middle of the apparatus in units of uh, the initial uh, beam width, okay? So if we split the, the beam a little bit, like here, so you can't really tell the two beams apart, you cannot put your finger in between, then you can maintain spin coherence for the atoms coming out. That's the number that's calculated here, that the C of T is just, it's just the length of the, of the expectation value of the Pauli vector operator for the spin. So if this is one, then you have full spin coherence. If it's zero, then you have lost all the spin coherence. And indeed, if you want to have a good separation of the beams, then, then there is no uh, spin coherence recovered, nothing at all, okay? And uh, so here you see how the, how the apparatus is calibrated. There really is no, no noticeable separation uh, in the Z direction, that's this number, right? The, the triangles, <clears throat> sorry, there's something wrong here, anyway. <clears throat> Uh, but but we, we cannot we cannot avoid some separation in some of the uh, some some of the directions because we have the three components of the magnetic field. Okay, so this is already the best we can do. So the conclusion is when the first John Gallag apparatus splits the beam noticeably, so we are not in this regime, but we are in this regime, and then it's over. Yeah, you cannot recover the spin, and that really tells you that quantum evolution is not reversible. Contrary to what Bohm and Wigner would tell you in these papers, they think that quantum evolution, as long as you haven't actually detected the atom coming out of the apparatus, you can undo everything that has happened. That's not true. So uh, let me summarize. <clears throat> okay, so first of all, there is this five-factor version of the leapfrog and that enables us to solve equations of motions with high accuracy. I showed you an example of, uh, uh, of, of one particle in 3D, but of course it's not limited to that. And uh, our application to the full-blown study of the stern gallagher interferometer confirms that quantum evolution is irreversible. <clears throat> so I thank you for your attention and uh, maybe we can have some questions and answers before we re reach the full hour. 
Um, and uh, uh, meanwhile, I show you the uh, references that I mentioned in the talk. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, speaker. Uh, yeah, we have a good amount of questions. So any questions in the audience? Uh, thank you for a nice talk. I wonder about the irreversibility part. Uh, is it, uh, where is it coming from? Is it coming from like not considering the like quantum system fully or what's the kind of physical source of that lack of irreversibility? Oh, well, I mean, the, quant the quantum system is considered fully. And by the way, we are only talking about uh, reversing what happens to the spin. We're not even talking about undoing the spreading of the wave function that also happens. Okay, so it's not even full uh, uh, reversibility that is addressed. It's just it's just recovering the original spin, and the answer is, I mean, um, the way the spin interacts with the magnetic field is just too complicated to to uh, undo uh, what has occurred before, right? Um, you, you you probably have in mind that since it's a unitary uh, evolution, well, there is another unitary operator which is the inverse, and I can just apply that and go back, but it doesn't work like that because uh, if you have a unitary operator like this, okay, uh, then uh, having a plus sign here is not a physical evolution operator because your Hamilton operator has to be bounded from below. But if you change the sign of this, just put a plus sign here, uh, you, the negative of this Hamilton operator is not a Hamilton operator. All right? So, so uh, you, cannot, uh, you cannot just say, well, why don't I apply the, the uh, adjoint of the unitary operator and everything goes back? Well, that's... That's mathematical uh, uh, reversibility, but it's not physical reversibility. Okay. So the question, the answer is that there doesn't exist Hamiltonian that drives you back. Well, yeah, that's 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 the answer. Of course, there are examples. For if you think of a, of a harmonic oscillator which has only one frequency. If you just wait for one period, it goes back to its original state all by itself. But that's of course uh, uh, sort of a silly example. Um, I would say the moment you have true nonlinearities in the system as you have it here, uh, well, there's no chance of going back uh, to the original state if enough evolution has occurred. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have a Zoom question. So I'm not sure if you can see the Zoom questions, otherwise I'm going to read it out. So the question is, could this irreversibility have applications in quantum computing, something analogous to hashing algorithms? I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Um, it's, it's probably it's probably the other way around that uh, it it will it makes some things harder because we often assume that we can have uh, 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 re re reverse operations that go back and I mean that's that's true for if you just think about two by two matrices or four by four matrices there there where where uh, all Hamilton operators are automatically bounded from below and from above. But the moment that you have continuous degrees of freedom, like the center of mass motion that we are talking about here, well, um, then, then your, your uh, available energies uh, will not be bounded from above. They will be bounded from below only. And, and, the, and the negative of the, ha of the Hamilton operator is not another Hamilton operator. So I, I really don't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, yes? Uh, yeah, uh, I have a question or maybe several questions. Let's see how far I can get with it. Um, so the the some of these um, uh, these split step methods or leapfrog methods which you discussed uh, should enjoy time uh, being time invariant under time reversal, right? Um, well, in this sense, in the sense of inversing time, and uh, if we neglect uh, all round of errors on a computer, we should exactly come back to the point where we started. Well, yes. I mean, if you look, if you look at um, the paper that I mentioned that uh, uh, this one, who were at all, right, where we do the benchmarking, I mean, that's what we did when we were, we were propagating uh, a, a system in, in say, uh, the landscape of a honeycomb lattice, right? where, where uh, you have bifurcation and so forth, right? So if you go forward in time uh, enough, yeah, and, you, and then you, you reverse the velocities and go back, uh, then that works, uh, as you say, because of the rounding. If there were no rounding off errors, it would work for any, any uh, distance in time. But in, okay. in, 
in fact it doesn't okay so one way of of benchmarking the quality of such an approximation is to see how far can you go forward and and, and actually go back to where you came from right sure this, and so this is so so, this, that, so, so uh, also uh, for this test this photo or the leapfrog does better than any of the other methods sure okay. uh, i think this is also used in in uh, some spin echo papers to to uh, measure, so to say, uh, experimentally, whatever we want to call this, uh, some uh, Lyapunov exponents or the inverse of them, some characteristic times. But my, yeah, my, question, yeah. actually, my question actually now is, okay, if, if we take such a method, which is uh, per se uh, invariant under time reversal, uh, and, and then you say, uh, yeah, but uh, because of the round off, uh, we can't go back. That means that the underlying system was non-integrable or chaotic. No, not necessarily. I mean, even even if it is integrable, uh, I mean, at one point you just accumulate too many round off errors, right? Um, Good. So if it is if it is say the underlying system is integrable, then you discretize or trotterize or whatever uh, do with it. Then uh, my question is, does it mean that uh, uh, this discretization is uh, uh, by itself in some of your examples involving or uh, generating uh, non-integrability and chaos? Um, I, I wouldn't say so, but, but you know, um, say you look at this, right? You break this up into time steps, okay? So you have to make a choice here, right? How, uh, if you take very, very many time steps, okay? Then, then for each time step, the evolution is, is very, very precise, but you, you just have a lot of them, right? which means that you have to do a lot of these uh, fast Fourier transforms that go from position to momentum space back and forth, right? So there's a lot of computation going on. Every one yes, of these computations yes. has little rounding off errors, okay? Yes, and, but and, what, uh, I, what I, what I pro yeah. probably I'm trying to refer, re to refer to is uh, my experience with uh, classical systems where we do the same things. Uh, and there are the, uh, the observation is, is if you take a, an underlying integrable system and you and you discretize the, the continuous time flow by these, uh, let's say, symplectic maps as they are called there, yeah, uh, yeah. then um, then uh, yes, of course you will you will uh, uh, accumulate errors, but they will usually accumulate uh, not in an exponential fast way. While if the underlying system was non-integrable, uh, say chaotic and is characterized by some non-zero Lyapunov exponents, then this, uh, this error will accumulate uh, if measured properly in an exponentially fast way. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's true. I mean, we also see this in, in this benchmarking exercise was, where we were looking at integrable system like, like just a Kepler problem, right? Um, and, and see how many, how many orbits we can go through b b before things become inaccurate. And, and uh, I mean, with this fourth order uh, leapfrog, we, we can literally do millions of orbits bef before you, you really uh, see deviations from the perfect Kepler ellipses. Whereas uh, some of the other methods, um, you, you start deviating much earlier, right? And so, Thank so you. but yeah, but if, if, if the underlying um, dynamics is, is uh, chaotic, so there are their bifurcation become very sensitive to small changes, then of course these things get out of control very quickly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. Uh, if there are no other further questions, we would go on to the next speaker, which I haven't seen yet. Ah, there he is. Okay, great. Then maybe come ahead. Uh, thank you so much. Let's thank the speaker again. Uh, <laughs>